Welcome everybody. Uh, today we will give you an introduction to EACCPF version two, hosted by the Society of American Archivists and more specific, specifically by the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards. Your speakers today are me, Karin Bredenberg, co-chair of TSEIS and also working at Kommunalförbundet Alfabundet Sydarkivera in Sweden. With me, I have Marie Eila, who is the team lead of EACCPF in TSEIS, coming from University at Buffalo in the United States, States. And we also have Ailey Smith, one of the team members coming from the University of Melbourne in Australia. So I will kick off and give you an introduction to the all over things. And then Marie and Ailey will introduce you to all the new features of EACCPF version two. So TSEIS, I think you heard, heard it before, we are the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards. That's why we have an acronym. So the background to our work is covered in an earlier presentation, which is also available on YouTube. Uh, the presentation that we are using today is available already on GitHub. If you want to have the links to work, you need to download it, but it's already there for you. So you can, when we have finished, start looking at it. Uh, of course, well, a part of why we don't provide all the links in the chat is that we are way available in a lot of places. So please take a look on, in the presentation and see where you can find us. When it comes to the standards we are maintaining, we do have revisions. We have an annual rolling revision cycle for minor releases. Uh, things happen every year. See more on GitHub where we have described this. But every fifth year, we need to look at our standards and see if we need a major revision. And that is, that is what has happened with the ACCPF. So there we are fol following the guidelines by the Standards Committee. So you can read more about that also on the web. What we also are following working in TSEIS is the design principles. There are 10, and I will only highlight the first one because you will see that is a thing that has come through in the whole of this revision of EACCPF. Simplicity comes first. So have that in mind, we are making, have been making everything easier. So rest of the schema principles and to get you all on the same page, I don't know how familiar all of you are with the ACCPF. Uh, I'm reusing some content developed from a short introduction to the TSEIS standard, standards that are available on the YouTube channel and short, short, what is encoded archival context, corporate bodies, person, and families. The goal is to describe corporate bodies, person, and families related to archival material. And a corporate body is everything that is not a person and a family. So a society, a small company, and so on. Everything that is not a person and a family. So we have, have had a the International Standard of um, Archival Authority Records being the base for the work. So we are, EACCPF is the technical representation of that standard. So everything is familiar if you have read the SRCPF. We also quite quickly will end up in XML. Uh, so XML, extensible markup language, I think you'll know that already. And we have the elements um, throughout the presentation. If something is in brackets, it's an element. And if it has the at sign, it's an attribute. So element contains attributes and we have element values and we have attribute values. You also need to remember that the parent, we have parents and children. So parent elements with child elements and that can be going on for a long time since it's possible to make it hierarchical. Uh, XML schema is something that we will also hear more about. There is where we de define which elements and attributes that can be used or have been used. And data type. 
the data type is telling what the element and attribute can contain. Is it text, numbers, text following specific rules, and so on? And the last thing that we also will throw, just throw you into is namespaces. So the home space for elements and attributes in the schema, where do things belong? Here we are already in the XML. So the structure for EIC is you have the EIC root element, and then you have control, which is the information about the XML file. You will hear a lot more about that later on, so I'm not going to stop there and give you all that. We are going to look into CPF description, uh, where we actually describe the entity. So that one has three child elements. The identity, where we actually describe uh, what type of entity we are describing. Um, identifiers, the name, and the name in all its forms. So really the first bas basic things of identifying our entity. The second one is the descriptions, uh, description element, where you actually give the description. It's here where you can give all the information you need to give about this entity. Existence, functions or occupations, Geographical or historical notes, places, you name it, it's there. Uh, also, these elements are, some are more, you can write a really long, long narrative, or it's more intended for indexing. So both of the, these types of descriptions are, are there, and you just write along and describe your entity. Uh, a short example where you can see that we both have the descriptive text, textual parts and we have more indexable parts. The last part that we describe are relations. So every entity we are describing has a relation to something. It's either another uh, corporate body, person or family. We can describe the relation to other, uh, to the archival resources, or we can describe to functions, or whatever, to, what we really need to create a relation to. A short example is this <clears throat> buildup of how a family is uh, constituted, where we have a grandfather, a mother, and a father. So everything here is created, all, all, this family tree, tree is created through the relationships, relations area. And we have these relations to actually make sure that we can connect everything since archival material, they are kind of complex and we need to be able to link and show how things are connected. So that's why we have the relations. When we have all this information, we need to create the ESE CPF documents in some way. And you can either do that through an XML editor Someone has helped you with writing a script so the information is gathered from other structured descriptions, or you are lucky enough to have a collection management system that actually can create these files for you. When we have the files, we want to show them, of course. We, these are made for sharing. So you can actually use a style sheet to transform, transform the XML into HTML displays. You can might have a collection management system that is uh, having a public interface so people that patrons actually can search and retrieve from it. Or you might have a special build system for showing off the EAC CPF documents. Three places is where you can actually look at EAC CPF live is in the connecting the dots, the same Samuel Johnson and his circle which was a project in 2012, where ESCCPF creates and shows all the connections for Samuel Johnson. Uh, Snack is something really familiar for you, for you in the US, and there you also have connections. You can see the ESCCPF, it's built upon ESCCPF. And coming over here to Europe, we have Archives Portal Europe, which also shows and use ESCCPF for the creators. 
And with that, I will actually hand it over to Marie and keep quiet and let you tell everybody what has been done during the last couple of years. So the focus of today's webinar is on the updates and the content. So I'm just going to briefly summarize the revision process here. Uh, slide. Um, for context, we're just over 10 years, about 12 years since the adoption of the original version of EAC CPF. Next slide. And this is the first major revision, which the team began working on in 2017 releasing a minor update the following year and placing the call for comments. So the resulting overhaul of the standard was submitted to Standards Committee and the SAA Council earlier this year, and EAC CPF 2.0 was adopted in August. Next slide. The overall goals for this major revision were simplifying where possible, aligning with EAD where useful, implementing features and solutions based on user requests and cleaning up any unused components. Slide. So you can get a very detailed explanation of the revision process on the EAC CPF website. Uh, if you go to the page on the side on the sidebar called EAC CPF 2.0 background and then click on the revision notes, you'll see a, a, a long a long detailed um, explanation of the whole process. Slide. Um, but now we'll give you, I'm gonna give you overview of some of these changes before we get into the details. The goal of EAD alignment is to better meet the user community's needs and allows the standards to work together. Slide. Um, so some elements were renamed as part of the alignment and some were renamed to be more precise. Ideally, these changes will make the schema easier to use and understand. Also, as part of the alignment, some elements were removed or replaced. Um, so I know this is a lot of text on the slide, but um, you can see sometimes elements were replaced by a new equivalent term or different term and sometimes by a combination of element with an attribute value. Slide. Um, also regarding simplification, EAC CPF 2.0 bundles elements in these two ways. So elements of the same type can be bundled with a wrapper element, a wrapper as plural element, and elements with different concepts can be grouped in element sets. Uh, there is a prescribed order for elements within the parent elements, <laughs> so prioritizing required and non-repeatable elements. Uh, restrictions were relaxed for some element content and attribute values, and you can see some examples here. Um, agency code, the ISO constraint is relaxed, and for country language and script code, um, the ISO standards constraint is relaxed to name token. And if you're not using XML a lot, the point here is that it's there's more flexibility for values. Um, I mentioned a couple more things, but Ailey is going to be covering um, some of these in more detail, including control in general, as well as showing examples of encoding. Um, so briefly, in control, these new attributes align with EAD. So encoding for country, date, language, repository, and script. Uh, as do these new optional elements. Um, the removal and replacement of attributes regarding external namespaces also further align with EAD. And finally, there are five newer replacement global attributes and we will have a detailed explanation of both internal and external referencing later, again with examples. Um, so that is a brief overview, and we'll move to Ailey to um, go into control. Thanks, Marie. Um, so as part of the revision process, we looked at making a number of improvements to the control section 
of the scheme. So that's where information uh, about the actual EAC CPF document is encoded. Um, next slide, please, Karen. Um, So elements that have been used to encode the status of a record, so uh, things like maintenance status and publication status, have been transformed from elements uh, within control into attributes of the control element. Uh, these attributes continue to use uh, the same limited set of values that were available uh, for the elements in the previous version of EAC CPF, um, but uh, these terms are currently under discussion as well. Um, next slide, please. Oh, no, we're already there. Um, other elements that have been transformed into attributes uh, in this version of EAC CPF are elements that contain information about the type. Uh, so maintenance event type has become an attribute of the maintenance event element and agent type has become an attribute of the agent element. Uh, as with the status attributes, uh, these continue to use the same uh, set of values that that the, uh, these elements had in the previous version with the attributes in the current version. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so several elements in the control section have been enhanced to improve some of the functionality. Uh, previously, you could encode conventions used, uh, sources, maintenance events, uh, and local types in the control section, uh, but it wasn't very easy to connect them with uh, descriptive details within the EAC CPF document. So now by including an ID attribute uh, on these elements, uh, you can refer to them from the other elements in the record by using uh, the relevant reference attribute. Uh, so if you wanted to, for example, connect a date of birth uh, to the source where the information was found, you can encode the source with an ID attribute in the control section of the EAC CPF record, then include source reference on the start date element uh, to refer back to that ID. Uh, and there will be some more information uh, a little bit later about using references within an AAC instance a bit later here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to go through just a couple of use cases uh, for control. So in this case, we're looking at creating a new EAC record uh, with information about a working group, uh, who created it and when it was created. So we have a unique ID, uh, an agency name, and a bit of information about the creation of the record. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is the example encoding that that can produce. Uh, in this case, this is about the uh, minimum information that you can have within a control record um, that you're required to have. So you can see that using the maintenance status attribute there, we know it's a new record and the publication status indicates it's in progress. We have a unique identifier, the agency name, uh, and further down, we can also see that it, the agent name is included there. The record was created with the agent type human, so we know it was created by a person, it's not machine generated. Uh, and we have the date there that this record was created. Uh, next slide. Um, so building on this previous example, we can start to add further details. Uh, so the creator here has identified that it does have, an, this record has an external audience, uh, that the publication is still in progress, and that they're wanting to use some data standards to create their record and want to know how to encode that in the record. So we have the uh, various different encoding attributes there uh, to be used to encode the uh, countries, uh, dates, languages, repositories, and scripts. Uh, next slide, please. And so adding all of these attributes, uh, you get a control element that looks like this. Uh, you can see the maintenance status and publication status that were in the previous example, they're highlighted there. Uh, these are now joined by the audience attributes, stating that it's an external audience. Um, and all the encoding standards for the record there, and that's the different ISO standards. Uh, next slide, please. 
So moving on to another use case, and this time we're looking at the maintenance event element specifically, uh, which is within control. Uh, in this case, the user wants to make an internal note about uh, what they did and why. So we still have the, the name and the date type information, but we also have a description of what happened uh, in this maintenance event. Uh, so next slide. And so here we can see how this looks uh, in the actual XML encoding. We have a maintenance event element with the type created. We have the agent type, uh, human again, so it's not a machine generated record. Uh, we have the date that this record was created, uh, both in text and in a standardized form on the uh, standard date time attribute. And in this case, we have the event description. So example for webinar. So this tells us that this particular uh, record was created uh, to be used as an example for this webinar. Okay, uh, next slide, linking and referencing. So moving away from control, we're going to talk about how linking and referencing works in EAC CPF uh, 2.0. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there's a number of options for external referencing uh, within the schema. Um, it's possible to reference uh, external vocabularies ontologies uh, using the attributes value URI, vocabulary source and vocabulary source URI, uh, and these are available on a large number of elements within the schema. Um, and so these can be used to point to external references where terms and vocabularies are being drawn from. Uh, it's possible to reference external sources for the contents of your EAC CPF record uh, using the reference element, uh, which is, sits within source in control. Um, and this can have an AHREF to provide a URI to a specific web page, uh, or it can also just include text. Um, and the reference element is also available within uh, several other element, you know, elements uh, within the record, uh, including I think event and abstract to reference external uh, sources for uh, some context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here we have a few different examples of using external referencing. Uh, at the top piece of code, you can see that this is a source. This would sit within control. Uh, the source is the Barack Obama Presidential Library. And we have an AHREF that points you directly to that reference. Um, in the second example there, uh, we have a name entry element. Uh, this is encoding the name Barack Obama, and this name has been taken from the vocabulary source uh, from Wikidata. So you have the vocabulary source URI there, and you have the value URI that points to the specific name within this. Um, and in the bottom section, we have a relation. Um, so it's a relation uh, element. This is pointing to a corporate body, so the Democratic Party. And at the bottom, we have a reference there that gives, provides more context for this uh, relation uh, with a URI there as well. Uh, next slide, please. So there are also some enhanced options for creating uh, internal references uh, within a single EAC CPF document. So the ID attribute is available on all elements uh, to, to assign an identifier that is unique within the instance uh, to those elements. Uh, there's also a new target uh, attribute that can be used to refer to the ID of another element from one element. Uh, so that's the way you can create links between elements within a, a document. Uh, you can also reference specific elements in control uh, from some of the descriptive elements in the EAC CPF instance uh, using specific attributes. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit more about this in the next section. Um, but first we can have a look at using ID and target uh, attributes to create some internal referencing. So next slide. Okay, so in this example here, we have an occupation uh, element at the top. Uh, so the occupation is an assistant examiner. Um, and then we have the place name down and the place name has a target with an ID you know, pointing to an identifier. So this identifier place one, uh, you can see below is the ID of the place element. 
And here we have a more detailed description of them as a place, including an address um, and the role of that place within this record as a place of work. Um, so using that ID on place and the target on place name means we can connect those details together. So you don't have to describe in great detail every time, you can just link back to the place there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Okay, so based on some user feedback, uh, this version of EAC includes the ability to encode evidence-based assertions. Uh, next slide. So for statements that form part of the EAC CPF description, you can encode who added the assertions based on which source and following which rules. Uh, and this is specifically useful, especially useful uh, where they might be conflicting statements in the EAC CPF description, uh, such as different spellings of a name or different dates of birth that have come from different sources. Um, so the new maintenance event reference attribute, uh, source reference and convention declaration attributes, allow you to refer from a descriptive element in the EAC CPF instance uh, back to maintenance event source and convention declaration elements. Uh, in the control section, and you can reference more than one of these elements uh, to encode this information. Um, next slide. Uh, so here we have an example uh, of how this is working. So I'm going to start by looking at the code on the bottom of the screen, which is a relation entry for Princeton University. It has a source reference, uh, source one, and a maintenance events reference, uh, me too there. Um, which would refer back to the IDs of things in the control section. So above you can see that source one is the ID of source, and this is the history of the University of Oregon. Uh, and the maintenance event is the top thing there. So it is uh, a maintenance event was updated by John Smith in 2021. So we know that this relation uh, was added by John Smith in 2021. Um, with the source base there of the history of the University of Oregon, specifically page 270. So we know exactly how that statement in the relation element came about. Uh, next slide. So local types, um, I mean, local types continue to be used in this version of EACCPF uh, as an attribute on elements. Um, and you can have references um, in control for the local type declaration where you declare what these local types are. There is now a local type declaration reference attribute uh, that can be added that can connect the two of those. Um, so next slide. Um, so here at the bottom, we have a name entry uh, for Hannah Arendt and we have a local type there saying that's a personal name and the local type declaration references is GNDO. So going back up to the top bit of code there, which would sit in the control section, uh, local type declaration with GNDO uh, shows us that this is local type is drawn from the GND ontology. Uh, next slide. So now I'm going to talk uh, more about the descriptive elements that have been uh, had some changes made in EAC CPF version 2.0. And we'll start with encoding of names. Um, so there have been several changes made to names within this version. So name entry parallel has been transformed into name entry set. And this is a wrapper element uh, for grouping two or more name entries. Uh, that represent different forms of the same name. So for example, the same name in different languages or different scripts. Uh, if you wish to indicate that this is a parallel name, uh, you can use a local type with the attribute with the value parallel uh, on the name entry set element to continue to do this. Um, once again, there are several elements uh, relating to names that have been transformed into attributes. Uh, so instead of having authorized form and alternative form elements. Uh, there's now a status attribute uh, that can have the values alternative or authorized uh, to continue this functionality. Um, and instead of having a separate preferred form um, element, 
there's now a preferred form attribute uh, available for name entry. Um, and this can have the values true or false. Uh, so if you wanted to indicate that one particular name entry is the preferred version of a name, uh, you can use that preferred form attribute on the name entry uh, with the value true. Um, and moving on to some examples. Um, so here at the uh, bottom of the screen, we have a name entry uh, it has a preferred form true. This is the preferred form of the name. Uh, the status authorised and the convention declaration reference of CD1. And now this convention declaration reference uh, points back to the convention declaration in control with the ID CD1. And this is the um, references AFNOR, uh, NZ, Z44060. Um, and that is the convention that's been used to formulate this name. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in this example, we have a name entry set with a local type parallel. And this example shows two forms of the same name. Um, so the first name entry is the German version of the name indicated by the language of element. Um, and the second version is a Japanese version of the name and uses a Japanese script. And you can see this in the script of element attribute there. Uh, looking at some of the other attributes of the name, you can see that while they're both authorised versions of Hannah's name, uh, the German version is the preferred version and local type attributes have been used to indicate that the first name entry is the native German version of Hannah's name and the second name entry is a Japanese translation of the name. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we'll go over to the next slide already. Okay, so uh, places can be fully encoded within a place element in, in this version, uh, and you can have multiple places within a plural places wrapper element. Um, place can also sit within uh, relations um, and form part of some structured chronological lists of events. Um, in this version, place uh, entry has been renamed as place name. So individual place names uh, can be included within singular elements such as function, uh, occupation and mandate uh, without a place wrapper element um, and the associated encoding. Um, next slide. So you can include a lot of context on places in this version. So the place element requires at least one of the name of the place, uh, place role, uh, the physical address, uh, digital contact information and geographic coordinates. Um, so place name is highly recommended to be included, but it must include at least one of these. Um, in addition to this version of EAC CPF uh, is the new contact element. Uh, this works very much like the address element that existed in the previous version. But where address encodes a physical address, uh, contact can be used for providing contact details such as email addresses, uh, websites, phone numbers, those sorts of things. Uh, and geographic coordinates uh, has also been added as an element in this version uh, to align with uh, EAD. Um, and previously you could encode it using attributes, but now it is an element in its own right. Um, you can also encode date information and other descriptive information within uh, place to give further context. So we'll get an example next. Um, uh, so here we have a place with a lot of detail. Uh, so we know the place name is the Tokyo Imperial Palace. It has a place role, so it's a place of birth for the uh, person that this uh, record is about. We have geographic coordinates. Uh, we have a complete street address uh, and we also have contact details uh, with the homepage for the Imperial Palace included there. Uh, next slide. Okay, so there's also been some changes to the way uh, dates can be encoded and this has been based both on alignment with EAD and with some user feedback uh, that based on the need to include information about uncertain and unknown dates in EAC CPF. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so to achieve this, uh, EAC has adopted the 
certainty attribute from EAD, uh, as well as the calendar and era attribute uh, in order to give more detail about dates. Uh, EAC version two also enables the use of the extended date time format, which can be used for encoding things like certainty and um, continuing date ranges. Um, and this uh, has been included in the latest ISO 8601 standard, and you can now use that within EAC CPF. Uh, a new status attribute has also been added to uh, from date and to date uh, to allow for including information about where a date range or part of a date range may be unknown uh, or where a date range is still going so it doesn't have an end date. Uh, next slide. And these are a few examples of some dates. Uh, in the first example, we just have a single date. Uh, this includes a certainty attribute with circa. So we know that the date is circa 1789, not exactly 1789. Uh, the second example is a date range. Uh, this date range, we know the end date, uh, which is circa 2010. And that is also using in the standard date, uh, the extended date time format. So that's what the question mark on the end is encoding. Uh, however, we don't know the start date of this range, so the from date has a status unknown. And in the third example, we have a date set, uh, which includes a singular date, July 2014, but we also include a date range that is on ongoing. So the date range hasn't ended, there is no to date, uh, so the to date has the status ongoing. Uh, next slide. So another section of EAC CPF that has had a number of changes and new elements and attributes added uh, is the relations section. Uh, next slide. So instead of having separate elements uh, for function relations, resource relations, and relations to other CPF uh, entities, there's now a single relation element uh, that covers all of these. So every relation element must include a target entity element uh, with a target type attribute. So the target entity is where you identify the related entity and the target type attribute is used to identify what the target entity is. It can be an agent, corporate body, family, function, person or resource. So instead of say having a CPF relation as you would have previously, you would now just use relation. Uh, with a target entity uh, with, that includes the name of that entity. And that target entity, we would have an attribute, say the target type could be person. Uh, for a CPF, it could also be family, corporate body or agent. Uh, and the same works for functions and, relation, and resources there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also have several new attributes uh, within relations. So we have a new relation type, and this specifies the type of relationship that's being described to the target, uh, that, that the target entity has to the targeted entity. Uh, we also have target role that can be used to provide information about the role of the target entity towards the entity described. And we can use further details from date, date range, date set, place, descriptive note, and object XML wrap to include XML from somewhere else that can provide further context about a relationship. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here is an example of a relation entity. So in relations, it's actually wrapping multiple uh, different relations there. So we have a full relation entity uh, element described here. Uh, the target entity is has the target type person. Uh, we know the name of the person is Paul Arendt. Uh, and we're giving a relationship type of family and a target role of parent. So Paul is the parent of the person who is in the actual EAC CPF instance that we're looking at here. Um, okay, well, I might pass this over um, for some talk about documentation. Thank you. And before I start, I'm actually going to put all of these links in the chat right now um, so you can see them, but they are also available in the PDF of the slides that we linked to earlier. Okay. Um, so 
this is uh, just an overview of highlights and changes we think will be most noticeable and hopefully most useful to the user community. Um, but we encourage you to look at the EAC CPF website, which has um, more detailed information. And there you'll find, um, again, details of the revision, but the link to the tag library, which does include snippets of examples for how that element or attributes are used. Um, there's also a link to the TSEAS GitHub site, um, where you'll find the new best practice guide. Um, and our team member Iris has created a short tutorial video, which is also linked here. Um, that's on the SAA YouTube channel that gives you a little tour of how the best practice guide works. Next slide. Um, so we have shown lots of examples and use cases, and on the GitHub site, um, there are there's an example of a brief record that's encoded and um, an extended record as well as two just sort of sample records. Um, but we would like uh, the best practice guide to include your use cases and examples. And you can submit examples or raise issues through the GitHub site. You can contact us. Um, we think that the best practice guide will work best when we can actually see people's real world examples of them. So if you're using this and you have questions or you have examples, we would be very glad to see them. Fine. Um, I guess that we, means that I'm taking yeah. over or yeah. well, something we have, like um, that. We have managed to do this in 45 minutes, so we, there are plenty of time for questions. I, Yeah, Karen, I can monitor chat or however you want, if anyone has questions. Exactly. So we were thinking about doing this through the chat, so I think we uh, can stop the recording now and do the questions without the recording. Uh, many, many 